All right, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. As we head into our slate of fall programming, I can't believe it's fall already. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for putting this program together and coordinating the Zoom. I am happy that we are able to host Faith Greger tonight to hear about the research she did using some of the collections at our Robinson Research Center. Faith Greger graduated from Kent State University with a degree in journalism and graphic design. She wrote professionally in the public and private sector sectors for 35 years. She is also an essayist, photographer, and designer. Ms. Greger has pursued a lifelong passion for community history through avid reading, research, and membership in professional organizations such as the Denver Women's Press Club. She has lived in Denver, Colorado since 1976, and uh, that is why she's wearing a sweater. We were joking about <laughs> that earlier. <laughs> um, Courage Says Keep On is her first book, so join me in welcoming Faith Greger, and thank you so much for um, zooming in with us tonight. Okay. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. And um, so here I am in Denver with my sweater, and uh, <laughs> we're all the way up to about 45 degrees today. So that's that's progress. So in any case, I'm very honored to be here tonight, and I hope that you and all your loved ones are safe and well. And many thanks also to the Rhode Island Historical Society for their interest, support, and flexibility to host this event in the era of Zoom. So I'm gonna start my slideshow now, um, and I'll just uh, be scrolling through this as we talk, as I talk. So one of the first things I noticed soon after I decided to write this book is that it's a very delicate balance to write a nonfiction book whose main character is a family member. And that was definitely the case with Courage Says Keep On, which I published in 2019. And that was about 20 years after the first spark of an idea that this was something that I wanted to try to do. Um, in the mid 1990s, a friend of mine was working towards her master's degree in social work at Smith College. And so as we had had conversations about this, I thought she might be interested to read about my grandmother's experiences describing her first year as a settlement house worker at Boston South End House. And so, um, this document, I had recently gotten my hands on it because my mother was packing up her apartment in preparation for a move out here to live closer to us in Denver. And uh, this is a journal that's about 140 pages long, and it's describing her, my grandmother, Rachel Whitcomb's first year as... Hey, Faith, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but your screen share isn't, isn't uh -oh. coming through. Okay. And we just practiced it. Yeah, well, <laughs> let's see here. Let me, um, let me find the end. That's probably, probably operator error. Let's see. Yes, operator error. It wasn't gonna happen all by itself. There we go. And then, right. yeah. Sorry about that. So this is the book. I'll just sort of quickly scroll through to where I was. This is the cover of the journal. Um, yeah, now I can see myself. So I thought something's missing there, my face. Okay, so anyway, this is the cover of the journal. It's about 140 pages long and it has a lot of details about her impressions of her first year at South End House. And she intentionally wrote it that way to be more of a, just describing what she was experiencing and less, less factual. So that offered me a lot of insight in what her day-to-day -day life was like and her dreams, her aspirations, her fears and, you know, uncertainties and just the day-to-day -day interactions with the immigrant community. So she describes here um, a, a day at South End House working with different immigrants and how she found that kind of when she went out of her own self, she was able to have a little more ability to interact in this whole new world that she was in getting into. Um, so it's just the whole book, the whole journal is full of all kinds of just impressions. And I think that was really interesting for me to read about a little more about who she was at that age as well, because I knew her as my grandmother much later in life. So my friend that was going to, to um, Smith College borrowed the journal and gave it back to me about three weeks later and said, you should write about this. So that was when my heart told me yes to do that. But the journey from that day to having a book in my hand was quite long. 
And so it, the journal starts in the summer of 1913 when Rachel Whitcomb was a new graduate of Vassar College with very little experience outside of what was pretty sheltered middle-class New England upbringing. And this is Rachel at age 15. And uh, so she, I look in her eyes and I see somebody very curious and kind of also very sheltered, but she had an idealistic sense of adventure that brought her to this job of working with many different members of this big wave of immigrants that were coming to urban centers in the Northeastern United States. And uh, she was a female college graduate looking for work that didn't involve teaching school. And in fact, there were quite a few pages dealing with that topic that came up in her family. Her father was um, a high school principal and his idea was that she would teach school and that was pretty much exactly what she didn't want to do. So she went through some, uh, some questions and answers in her mind in this journal about making the decision to become a uh, settlement house worker. And she was uh, a female college graduate looking for work. And in that time, there were a lot of people, a lot, a lot more women were graduating college, but there weren't too awfully many more career options for them. And this is uh, her Vassar College yearbook. She's the uh, second from the bottom there. And uh, she, she, went to, um, she went back home in the summer of 1913. And uh, this, then in, the, in September, she took the job at South End House. And so at, at settlement houses, which is where she worked, the staff and the residents lived and worked in these facilities. And they were located in urban centers where there were large immigrant populations. And their job was to help the immigrants to settle and make connections with the services they needed, schools, jobs, housing, food. And their assimilation was a big goal. And that turned out to be uh, something that I took, uh, it took some time to pursue the idea of how that was different to have the assimilation be the main goal and how that's kind of a nuanced idea now with people um, are, the, the cultural identity was, seemed a little less important than the idea of here you are and let's, let's become Americans now and here's how we're going to help you do that. So very well intentioned, but I think sometimes that issue of assimilation was more more than a lot of people coming in were ready for in terms of how do I do this and not give up my cultural identity. But, um, you know, that, that being said, that was kind of a theme that went through the whole experience of researching and then writing this book. And Rachel wrote very extensively about her day-to-day -day experience as a settlement worker. And for that reason, she opened up a window for me in a very interesting time in American history. And she personally wasn't famous, but she was in that first wave of women professionals in the brand new field of social work. Um, and she and her friends at Vassar were involved in the women's suffrage movement, and they were looking for fulfilling careers. And her journal entries often described how it felt to have a foot in two worlds, which were often in very stark contrast. And I think that was probably a very common experience for a lot of people in that time. So many things were changing. And as I researched Vassar at that time, their leadership was struggling to come to terms with some of the social currents of the time while maintaining what I kind of, in my perception, it was sort of a patronizing and protective attitude that they had toward their students. They, you know, you will keep you safe and yes, you're gonna be studying and having academic adventures, but still you're, you're young women and this is what we have to do to take care of you and protect you. So. It was really interesting to see all those currents kind of operating together. Um, and then once Rachel ventured outside the academic world, she experienced the peak of the progressive era, lots of different social currents, rapid industrialization in the urban setting, this big immigrant wave and World War I and the Spanish flu pandemic. And so a lot of things happened during the time that she had her sort of almost about a 10 year career. So all of this source material suggested that here was somebody who was kind of adventuresome yet very traditional and somewhat sheltered young woman living in an extraordinary time. So um, with that kind of frame up for that, I decided to just, in order to allow her to story to tell itself, I needed to create a space 
for her own written words to interact with the local and regional and national events and the narrative along with that. And she actually did keep another journal in, in 1917. And this page, Friday, April 6, was the day World War I was declared. And at that time, the family was struggling with an issue of her younger brother who wanted to leave college and go enlist. And father wanted her to, wanted him to stay home. So she kind of just writes all this down. Oh, by the way, war is declared and Leonard wants to leave and not go back to Amherst. And you know, she's kind of had this way of just putting everything in a very um, matter of fact way. So it was interesting for me to, to see that part of how she just sort of used her observational skills that turned out to be just what she needed to have as a social worker. So I had the family documents and then in uh, around 2005 I started conducting in-person research in the three cities where she worked and first in Boston for about six years and then in Dover, New Hampshire for about a year and a half and then in Providence, Rhode Island for about two years and my goal was just to scoop up everything I could, gather it all, find everything I could that related directly to her story. And then also I did a lot of reading about the social work uh, profession in those days, the settlement house movement, so that I could have a full complete background um, set of material to really tell that story. So then that took um, quite a number of years and I just sort of had had just this pile here and this pile there, literally in my basement, but then it became to get a little more organized and it felt like I was weaving, like really doing a, a weaving involving different colors of yarn. So varying quantities of each component, the family records, the primary sources, all the books on the relevant topics. And then also the in-person visits and the interviews at the Two of these places where she worked are still operating. South End House is called United South End Settlements now. Federal Hill House, of course, still operating and thriving and, and serving its community. Um, so that was really interesting and very, very uh, affirming for me to go to those places and see, yes, this is really still happening. So I wanted to tell that part of the story too. And then just all, so all those components came together and those were my piles of yarn. And then I had the interaction among these various sources and that actually became the narrative. So, um, and interestingly enough, that approach now kind of informs the way I feel about the present and about its relationship with history as we are in the process of re-examining so many events of the past now and how they relate to present ideas about race and gender and public health and culture and all kinds of other things. Um, just that idea of let's look at it all and not feel like I have to compare or necessarily come up with an assessment or a judgment, but just really take a full look at all of who this person was and who they were in the particular time that they, that they lived and, and had, their, had their work. So to begin the process of building courage says keep on, I started with the two bookends of her career. So Boston from 1913 to 1919, and then Providence from 1920 to 1922. So I decided to come to Providence first because that was the uh, part of the family history that I didn't have too much information on written down that Rachel had provided or passed on to my mother or my aunts. Um, and so I thought, well, if I just focus on the, what kind of feels to me like the thin part of this story in terms of family records, I track down the primary source documents, and then that confirms and builds on these family conversations. And then I supplement that with other viewpoints and sources, such as visiting places where she worked and talking to people that are there at this time. So my first stop when I got to Providence was the public library. And it was a rainy day. I don't know if they still have that beautiful ginkgo tree out front, but that was, I walked down those steps and headed for the microfish downstairs and kind of immersed myself in that cave for about three hours or so. And I found a really great trove of research of articles about Federal Hill, Hill, House, Hill House in the early 1920s. And some of these were written by Rachel herself. So 
as she kind of drew away from journal writing and didn't have so much time to do that because she had a more responsible job, she did write several feature articles for the Providence Journal. And uh, she worked at um, Federal Hill House for just over 18 months. And this is a picture of her at that time. And um, she was the head worker, so she was a resident worker and lived at the house in all the settlement houses. <clears throat> the residents lived there so they could have time to time and place in the community and be part of the neighborhood themselves. And so um, she, she lived there at that place, which at the time was uh, 400 Atwells Avenue. And this is that new building. This building was put up in 1916. It was about two years after they incorporated as Federal Hill House. And so this, is, this was her workplace. Um, this is an article from the Providence Journal. It's kind of, some, I used some of this material in the book. This one I did not because it just wasn't good, good, good enough quality to include in the book. But she wrote this um, about kind of, it was a feature article about life at Federal Hill House, some of the people they served and some of the activities. And so that um, was kind of a nice, charge for me and like an electrical charge when you say oh there she is there's there's my grandmother there's an article that she wrote and made it real made the story real for me um, and this is from another feature article that she wrote this is um, a photograph that was used from it's uh, Italian street vendors on flower day and so I think that was the tag for that story it was about one of the one of the activities in Federal Hill at that time and then, so I got all that stuff from the library, and then I headed over to Federal Hill House today, which is on Cortland Street now, and to see what it was like, what were they doing today, what some, and so I interviewed the uh, director there and a few of the staff about some of the programs, and then I just kind of got a tour of the building and saw some activities. Um, this is an after-school program, and this is a preschool program, so it just felt good to be in the place and physically seeing what this is. They're still serving the community. And, and this, is, this is right here, right now. So I think just visiting the places and physically being there was also really great to do. Um, so I toured the place and I interviewed. And by this time, it's about 6 o'clock. So then I went out on Atwell's Avenue and picked up the most delicious sausage and pepper sandwich that I've ever had, took it back to my hotel room, and that was just a very happy day for me to consume that, that wonderful food and just think about all the, all the time that I had spent that day to kind of affirm this story. So that was, that was a happy time. And, and then I was able to start kind of framing up the story and building, building these different places and the whole perspective and the whole picture. So the next time I came to Providence, I came to the Rhode Island Historical Society and even more of the story revealed itself to me then. And I learned about how Federal Hill House had its origins in philanthropy and it was originally called the Mount Pleasant Working Girls Club. And it started in 1887 by Alita Sprague, who was a philanthropist lady and she gathered volunteers and 23 working girls and women and organized the Mount Pleasant Working Girls Club. And it's, this is a quote, and it's, her goal was to meet with those of their sisters who passed busier days in closer contact with the hardships of life. So many of the programs, in the original settlement house movement had to do with just having a place become a neighborhood. So people were struggling to get their footing in a new country and they just, they needed some, some help just to become a neighborhood. And I think that was very typical of all the settlement houses and, this, and particularly Federal Hill House and South End House. So this club, the Mount Pleasant Working Girls Club um, was renamed Sprague House. And soon after that, they opened a facility at 7 Armington Avenue where they began to serve the growing population of immigrants coming from Southern Italy and then in 1914, it was incorporated as Federal Hill House. And the work had expanded over the last couple of decades, but the immigrant population in the neighborhood was about 40,000. And most of them were from 
southern Italy. So other resources that I was able to access at Rhode Island Historical Society kind of helped me zero in on some of the peripheral issues of that immigrant experience um, from the perspectives of the people working with them and also from the people being served. And it was very much um, a very important thing for the people in Federal Hill to preserve their cultural identity and their families. And so I tracked down a master's thesis that was written about just how that delicate balance was achieved. And um, it was kind of, I think the staff and the leadership at Federal Hill House learned pretty soon that they would have to move towards um, allowing a little more of that cultural identity to in, in, in come into that workspace and not just be, here we are to help you become Americans, but to really uh, get some people that were living in the neighborhood to come to work at Federal Hill House. And so they did, but it was, it went a little bit slowly than, more slowly than perhaps would have been optimum. But um, as they began to hire more people to work that were from the Italian ethnicity, it, it did help with their overall participation. But it wasn't until 1937 that they hired their first program director of Italian descent. And when I came to interview, the staff at Federal Hill House the second time. We talked quite a bit about that. One of the ladies on the board of directors was um, the daughter of one of the immigrant group, one of the immigrant families that, that came uh, at this time when my grandmother was working at the Federal Hill House. And she described that process of kind of how the, the immigrant population sort of rolls with time a little bit and how they were this population was served by another ethnicity, and then that slowly sort of invaded, invaded is probably not a great word, but slowly sort of evolved to um, become, you know, a little more uh, reflective of the culture they were serving. And then over time, then that evolved again. So I think it's an ongoing process that they're very much aware of. And I think that's what kind of makes it work so well today, because people have to be a little more aware of who they're serving and what the, what the cultural attitudes are and the openness of that. So that was an interesting thing for me to try to study and get my head around and, and write about without, as I said, without being too much of a, a comparison uh, way of looking at it and saying, okay, this is how we did it then. And this is how we do it now. And we know better. And, but it, it was just, it, it just, it told a story. The story told itself because I just grabbed all these kind of primary sources and experiences with interviewing people and walking around and just, it, it kind of, that helped me keep to my, my idea of letting the story tell itself. And so, um, you know, also those sources that they had at Rhode Island Historical Society helped me understand this fairly typical pattern for staff to go from being philanthropists to being social workers, because that was another thing that happened during that time was the social work profession was born. And my grandmother's direct supervisor at South End House in Boston was the first female graduate of the first school of social work in the United States which was called Boston School for Social Workers, and it's now part of Simmons College. Another earlier one was uh, Columbia University. But um, she, her name was Esther Barrows, and I think she, one of the things that was challenging about her work was to try to um, kind of bring in these people like my grandmother who were pretty, uh, pretty wet behind the ears in terms of, uh, real experiences and give them the background that they needed to later become social workers and to develop that field into more of a social science and less of, you know, less of the philanthropy is an important piece of the background, but I think it became more apparent that they were, uh, they were scientists and social scientists. So that was another thing that happened during her time that she wrote about and that Esther Barrows wrote a book herself about that, how that worked, and part of what her book was about was that idea of becoming a neighborhood. So um, one of the other important uh, 
pieces of information that I got from these organizations was their annual reports. And these were not terribly lengthy. Um, this one is from the neighborhood house in Dover, New Hampshire. And this is it for their whole first year. These, you have three paragraphs here that said, yeah, we started, we opened up, we built some playgrounds, people came, now more people are coming, we have a well baby clinic, we have English classes. So they weren't very lengthy, but they did serve to inform me as far as what was going on with the patterns of these places. And these were important documents for the settlement houses to provide in order for their benefactors to say, okay, you're doing great work, let's give you some more money. So I think um, that was an important piece of the, the organization's ultimate survival and also a piece of history that was very helpful for me. And I had a couple more of those moments with um, these particular types of documents where I just felt so invigorated just to read her name on that she was, he, she was here, this, this was where she was. And this is something from uh, Harvard's uh, Houghton Library, um, just who's doing what, where they are, and her name, Rachel's name is in here. And so I just, that was somehow just such an energizing experience to, to see her name in relationship to all the work that was being done at these places. And uh, so then when I got to Houghton Library, I found about three large legal size files of all of Robert Wood's records, his family records. And Robert Woods was the founder of South End House and he was, um, he came from a seminary background. So, uh, but he's, he was one of the, uh, he was, he was a, a leader in the settlement house movement. So he did a lot of speaking, a lot of writing. And so his, his work and his documents were very important for me to kind of get the backbone of this story. But one of the things that was also wonderful to see were these scrapbooks of, well, I'm gonna back up a little bit, back up to another piece of this. I got kind of twisted up in my, my content versus the slideshow here. Yeah, I was gonna talk about newspaper articles a little bit um, and just to scroll through here. These articles were, were really interesting and informative because they often reflected the attitude of the community um, that was reading these articles. So this one is about um, the Italian mothers learning English. And typically what would happen is the family would come and settle in and the father, the wage earner typically would go out and would learn English on the job and the children would learn English in schools. And then the mothers were usually the last group to learn English in the family. So this uh, particular article here talks about teaching English to Italian mothers and kind of how it was. And it's, it's sort of a, a nice, warm, fuzzy speed, uh, you know, feature article. Um, and then interestingly enough, this one is also teaching mothers to speak English. This one's from South End House. That particular population, um, more Eastern Europeans, some Italians, of course, in the North End, um, but a little more diverse in terms of the people that were learning English. But the newspaper articles were where I got kind of a feel for how the community and the immigrant population were interacting with one another and what some of these attitudes were in the community. And that also helped me to frame up some of the content of this book. Um, so here's an article from the Boston Herald about um, a presentation that was done with some people that were at South End House. Um, and it says there in the, sub, in the subhead, all intent on Americanism. So you did have this kind of current of, um, they were there, they were there as a social service, but it was very much, um, it, was, it was very important for them to become American citizens. And I think in and of itself, um, because this huge influx of people were coming in, that was a good thing to have people get settled. Uh, however, it just, it was, it was interesting to see this kind of in the historical context of what we are looking at with different, uh, different viewpoints on our culture these days. Um, 
This one talks about the responsibility of the people that were already here to help the people that were coming in. And this was, um, I think, an editorial uh, sort of article slash editorial merged a little bit. This was in Dover, Dover New Hampshire. Um, and this talks about, hey, all you people that came from someplace else, now it's time to time to come up and, and help the people that are coming in now. So he's speaking about the different uh, groups that came from different places and um, how it was really important for the city of Dover, which was a little bit smaller, to yes, be proud of your ancestry, but also to take that privilege and pay it forward a little bit. So I thought that was, it's, it was interesting for me to kind of come across those types of things. Um, so this now is from South End House. This is part of a scrapbook that talked about, showed all the different activities they had. This was another piece that um, was very informative of just the overall life of the community was to find just these little documents. Um, and also at Rhode Island Historical Society, I would run across different documents that would just sort of give a feel for the day-to-day -day experiences that were happening at these places. So here's a little party for Thanksgiving and some, some just short articles about uh, this and that that were going on at the, at the South End House neighborhood reception. This is South Bay Union, which was one of their facilities. Um, some of the things they offered there milk and baby hygiene, well babies clinic, school, uh, kindergarten, dramatics. So just all the things that make up a neighborhood. And it was just really good to have all that information to give me a, a sort of a portrait of that. And this is a picture of a rooftop garden and Rachel was involved in some of these projects at South End House up on the roof. Um, in the heat of the city, having a garden, and she, she really enjoyed that type of work that she did with the children, and she wrote about some of that in her journal as well. This is Winning Farm, which was a children's camp. I think it was about $4 a week for them to go there and just get out of the city and have some time. Um, this was donated to South End House by one of the benefactors of the house, so they, they owned this estate, and then Rachel, learn how to drive so that she could drive the kids up to this place. And then I think that driving, Boston driving probably was just as bad then as it is now because she never drove much for the rest of her life and was very nervous to be in the car with anyone else too. So I don't know, <laughs> I kind of think maybe driving up there might have, might have given her a taste of life behind the wheel and she decided maybe she might not want to continue doing that. So. These are all the things I sort of picked up on and maybe embellished a little bit, but um, it was just, that was a great little immersion to just spend the day at that library. And uh, there were so many documents there. I just, I photographed all of them and then brought them back to Denver and spent about a year transcribing everything. And, you know, for more kind of immersion in that whole experience, that was very helpful just to sit and read these things and write them down and they kind of, I just kind of absorbed all that somehow. This is um, a little boy in the South End from that same, that same scrapbook. And this is uh, a performance uh, of the South Bay Union Club drama group. And this drama program was headed by Margaret Shipman who was uh, a great friend of my grandmother's who later become her sister-in-law. She, her younger brother, George, came to Boston and went to um, Harvard Law School and met my grandmother and they had a long courtship. But Margaret Shipman also worked at, at South End House. And so that's kind of how that whole um, romance got started. It was a very long courtship. They didn't get married till 1922, but they met in 1917. And she makes a lot of references to going went to here with George, there with George. So it was kind of fun to see how that all, how that all evolved in the family. Um, so just getting back to that idea of primary resource material, I think it's just something I think is very powerful a lot for a lot of nonfiction writers. And a few years ago, I attended a lecture by Eric Larson, who's one of my favorite writers of nonfiction narrative. And he spoke about that research phase of it. And 
there's something kind of electric about the direct contact with source material and places. And when I would walk down these streets, I would just keep getting that sense of energy combing through these original documents, walking down Atwell's Avenue in Providence, and then in Boston. Um, it kind of, this is a scene from one of those scrapbooks. This is what the street looked like near where the South End House was. And this is a picture I took walking down the street in that same neighborhood about 100 years later. And so it just, it pulled me right into the time just by being there. So that was, that was very inspiring. Um, but sooner or later, the research had to come to an end. And I had this, it was really hard for me to stop researching and start writing. I just found that I loved the research so much after just getting my hands on all this abundance of rich materials. But um, I still didn't have a good sense of what she was doing between 1919 and 1920. It was sort of a blank space. No one talked about it in the family. Um, the only thing that I got from my mother was that she was in this another settlement house in New Hampshire and things weren't very happy right then. She was lonely. She had had about three colds that year and she was missing her family connections, but I had no idea where this was. So it was just a space that I had no information on. So I kind of resigned myself just to okay, this is not going to be filled in, and I don't know where this place is. And as I was combing through some more documents, I had called, I had contacted Vassar as I was organized, uh, organizing material about her college days. And she had, she had uh, filled out a couple of those alumni surveys. And on one of them, she reported her work history, and that included the missing settlement house name and location. So that was great to find that out. So um, that was in Dover, New Hampshire. And here's a, a, a picture from the, that's actually from the library. They have a beautiful framed picture of, of Dover. Um, it had, I think about 30,000, maybe 40,000 people at the time she went there. So they, their library had extensive records on that settlement and on her work there. So um, after I found this place and I learned of its existence and more material for me, I headed back to um, New England to put the finishing touches on this research. So I visited South End House, and interviewed people there to see what they were doing in the, in the here and now and got some more documents from them and made that kind of modern day connection. And then I was off to Dover um, Rachel was hired by uh, a place called the National Civic Federation, and that was a business and community um, philanthropic organization that was put in place um, to just, again, help with some of the, the urgent problems at the time, housing and work. And I think they also were kind of trying to keep the socialist undercurrents from getting a toehold because a lot of these um, the business community that was involved with the National Civic Federation were people like the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies. And, you know, they did, they did a, a lot of good work in the community, but I think it was a little bit of, boy, we better get a hold of this thing because this progressive era is going hog wild and we need to get, we need to come in and help to sort of restore a little bit of order while we're helping out here. So, I did get kind of a little bit of an interesting undercurrent of that, that process as well. So um, the National Civic Federation hired her and they hired her to go to Dover, New Hampshire, where mostly French speaking uh, folks from Quebec were coming because the, popul the, the, the um, economy there was very bad at the time. And there were quite a few mill jobs, mill worker jobs for them. So they came in, um, and she was hired to start a settlement house there. And it was called Na Dover Neighborhood House. And here it is, this is a picture I took um, when I came to visit that library there. So this is where she lived and she started quite a few um, programs there. Most of them were recreational programs, but um, this is what it looked like after the first year. Here's their party that they had to celebrate their first year of operation. And she started some recreation programs, some health programs, and um, some of the um, health programs involved nutrition 
they hired some people to come in from the university extension service. This is a class in uh, instructing the women's club on low cost meals. So quite, quite uh, practical things designed to help people cope with uh, just how tough it was to make a living in those days and in that place. Um, these are some children on the playground playing croquet and then you see that big mill building in the background. That was what was so um, kind of powerful about that place was the mill was such a big part of their lives and it just seems like it's just kind of the backdrop for everything that was all a lot of these pictures had had these big smoke these big stacks and here it is today um, it's now been turned into um, residential lofts but um, this just walking around there and reading all the things that I got my hands on at, at the Dover Library also helped me visualize her experience and write about it and I walked along the river here on that nice sunny day and there was a document that um, she had written the only document that I had from that time that just says you know, it's cold and I'm walking on the river and I don't feel like it's cheering me up very much and I'm trying to get over my third cold in two months. And so I kind of put myself in that place. And that's um, usually, you know, when writing nonfiction, you're supposed to not go to that. This is what they must have been thinking kind of thing. But I just couldn't help doing that because it was just, I could just kind of picture her up there all by herself. And but that was it. I had that one little document and so I was so fortunate to be able to find research to really flesh that out. So there I am walking by the river and looking up at those those brick walls and um, I could sort of imagine why she had banished that whole year from her spoken memories. So again kind of going back to that power of a physical place. Um, and so in the book, I wanted that to be part of the woven, the yarn, you know, the, the weaving, my, my, my kind of title theme. Um, it all started ties into that. So, and then also bringing in the present physical space and experience through my interviews with the staff at Federal Hill House in Providence and at South End House in Boston. And there were some local agencies in Denver that I visited too, to see, to talk to them about, um, some of the ways they were serving the immigrant community and economically challenged populations. And in one place I visited, they said to me that um, the most important thing for them was being human to one another. So I, that's, that was kind of my takeaway from all of these places. That was what they were all doing to be successful was being human to one another. And that was only about six months before I published the book that that person that I interviewed said that quote, and then that just sort of made it all magically tie together. And I wasn't really necessarily waiting for that to happen, but it's just kind of being open to all the different sources and all the different people that, and documents and places, it just all made it sort of evolve in a way that the story was telling itself. And so um, I kind of coming to the end of the, the uh, spoken part now, but I just want to, say again that I feel so fortunate to have had the help of the staff at the Rhode Island Historical Society to tell Rachel's story. And I've always felt that the local aspect of history is the most so powerfully able to engage us. And for me, it was just that sense of, that sense of place. And just the bonus was having a chance to get my hands on all these materials that helped me to describe this tale from 100 years ago that's still unfolding right now. And so to bring that idea into the book and continuing the work, I decided to end it with a poem that Rachel wrote in her mid seventies when she returned to her lifelong love of writing. And the last line is also the title of the book. And it's called, the title of the poem is Being. Not clear, not clear, the road says no. And yet we push our way for life or loss, we do not know, but courage says keep on. So with that, I'll take myself out of screen sharing and open it up for questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Faith. That was great. Um, so I have a question in the chat for you. Um, so this is sent to me privately if, uh, if anybody didn't see it. Um, I apologize. Uh, 
So for you, Faith, it sounds like you had a great plan for research and a way to integrate the different threads. Were there any big surprises, either in the, conclu in the conclusions you came to or the primary source information that you found? Well, I think the surprise of it, this, the biggest surprise was being able to get my hands on a document that led me to the Dover neighborhood house. So I think yeah. I was surprised that um, those alumni surveys actually had, had a real purpose. So, you know, kind of most of the time it's just, oh, please, I don't want to fill this thing out. But I'm so glad that she did. So that was one yeah. surprise. And I think um, the other thing that was interesting to me was, I think, how much of the approach to uh, integrating the immigrant experience was so fluid over time. And I, I had a lot of trouble personally trying to figure out how do I write about this? Because as I dug into it, it was very clear to me that, you know, I was looking at some that definitely attitudes that are kind of in the past and probably should stay in the past. So yeah. as I started reading, especially material from Robert Woods, it was really interesting to me how I think they themselves were evolving in their own approach to how they how they worked with the immigrant population, and so just to see um, see how fluid it all was, and you kind of think of a piece of information as a document that's kind of a, a, a solid place in a space and time, but that whole uh, that whole way that the social work profession evolved. So that, I think that surprised me a little bit to see how much they were really kind of just um, they were they were flying without a net in a lot of ways. It was just here we are. Um, here's what I'm going to do today. And I, I read a book about Jane Adams, who was that was very specific towards that point where she would just see what was going on in the neighborhood and was very um, uh, just responsive to what was going on in that moment. So it was quick and it was here we are, we need to help and let's, let's see what we can do. So I think the spontaneity of it and the fluidity of it was really, was really interesting and inspiring. Great. Um, so we've had a few more questions come in. Thanks folks for sending them. Um, so next question for you, Faith. Um, do you have any information about the funding for Mount Pleasant um, or Federal Hill House? Uh, which philanthropists or organizations, were they religious groups or non-sectarian? Um, I believe that they were non-sectarian. And from what research I was able to glean, I think that uh, the woman named Alita Sprague was, she and her, her, her friends and, and colleagues, I believe, provided the initial funding for those programs. Um, and so I, I don't have a lot of information about that specific piece of it. Great. Um, so next question for you um, from Michael Lang. Um, any suggestions that you would have for those doing primary source research and any suggestions you have for those that work in the memory slash cultural heritage institution um, for how to better help researchers based on your experiences? Um, I think that uh, just to have the full range of information available, one of the things that happened to me when I was when I was doing research was I would keep turning up more stuff that I thought I had looked at everything and now here's more stuff. And so I got a little bit, um, I, th I think the, the institutions that provide research um, if, if there's a way to kind of have a little more access, I don't know, that's not the right word, access is not the right word, but uh, kind of a holistic approach to, to, to the research, the research uh, project per se. So um, here's something that maybe might help you that's kind of not necessarily related to your initial yeah. topic of inquiry, but just for that, for the researcher to, uh, the researcher, the, the, the provider of research, the facility 
I think the more open they are, the better it was for me. So I kind of found that I discovered that um, if somebody had just a, a, an overall interest for history in general and for documents, just to, to kind of say, yeah, the door's open. Here's something else that might lead you on your research path. Because I, I didn't know I was going to be a passionate researcher, but then I kind of just found myself kind of jumping from one lily pad to the next, yeah. just having an overall scope of what the institution would have to offer. And so that's kind of, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but um, especially in terms of um, the, the memory and cultural mm -hmm. uh, issue that, that um, was brought up. I think that more and more people, I think, are expanding into that area. And so you kind of have to have that feel for what's related to this and how, how could I possibly, what could take this person in another direction? And, you know, then, then I get to do 20 more years of research, which is great. <laughs> Um, I like your answer a lot. I agree. Sometimes the, um, the side material provides the context or you find that jewel that you weren't expecting in a completely exactly. different source. Yep, I understand what you're saying. Um, so I have another question for you um, from Sandra. Uh, would you tell us something about your grandmother in later life when you knew her and what you learned about her in her earlier life? Well, when I knew her, um, she was in her 60s and 70s, and uh, my parents were divorced when I was seven, so we moved back to the town where she and my grandfather lived. So she became um, my lunchtime caregiver and my after-school caregiver was when my mother was working. So that's how I kind of feel like I got to know her quite a bit, because um, especially in her later years when she started writing, up at um, my cousin's house because writing was too hard for her to do in her own house because of all the ways that a writer can make excuses for not writing. So anyway, she would go up there in the morning to write and I would go to school and come home for lunch and we'd kind of talk about what we did for, for the morning and she'd share her poems with me. And um, I got to know how she and I had some common interests such as the beautiful Atlantic Ocean and we kind of found our nature connection and we found um, our writing connection. And she um, was a book collector, so she had lots of opportunities for me to stick my nose in a book, which I did quite a bit when I was a kid. And that was another common ground that, that we had. So I think what I learned about her growing up was um, how different she was from me in many regards um, in terms of her her approach to life and her traditional ways and, you know, the, who she was, but kind of, we, we had an intersection. We had who I was and who she was, and then we kind of had that creative bond. And I think that was, um, that was when I learned about, about that aspect of her that didn't necessarily come out during day-to-day things that we were doing with the family, but we had that sort of special bond together. And uh, so it was, it was um, that was written, I wrote about that in um, the intermediate chapters, kind of how that was, how that was part of me also getting the spark to tell the story besides the journal that my friend had that was from the days at South End House. Great. Um, so I'm gonna jump off of that a little bit. Um, and what I was actually curious about, uh, when we know our grandparents or our parents, it's in a very certain context. And then um, you did this amazing research on your grandmother. Was there anything surprising that you found out about her um, in her early life that you just didn't know or didn't expect to find that just kind of took you back? Um, well, I think she had her mind made up sometimes about different people and different populations. And uh, that was a little jarring to read sometimes that sort of, it was, it was, I didn't know how to approach that in the writing. And I decided that was, that was where I kind of had the spark of the idea of let's pull in all the context I can. And then that will be the provider of, you know, how somebody assesses this. Um, but she, she was surprisingly opinionated about 
a lot of things just sort of before she would she would go in with this kind of expectation and then um so that was that was a little bit that was a little bit surprising um and then i think um i also was surprised at how easy it seemed to be for her to shift from these radically different um places where she was she's in this traditional family and then she was in down in the south end in the in the tenements and it would just be so easy for her to make that shift and because she wrote in the journal, well, I went to this party and then we had this Christmas event and then I went to work and I thought how, how difficult that must have been to make that just huge transition. Um, but she just, it was, it was kind of like she took it in stride somehow or maybe she didn't really put it in the journal, but I thought that struck me as um, just how, how it must have been for a lot of working women in that time, just I'm going from one world to another world. Yeah. Um, so, and she, when she rode the train, sometimes she'd run into people from school and she'd say, oh, here's so-and-so and here's the job they have. And so it was just her kind of matter of fact approach to that yeah. big, big contrast. All right, well, um, Geraldine, do you have any final questions? I'm very curious um, how, as an independent researcher, were you able to fund doing all that research and all that travel and making copies and, and getting your hands on things like that? Well, part of it was that when my son went to school in Boston, so I would kind of tag the research trip ah. onto that because I had to go back anyway. And, um, and it was great to uh, also be able to make it reconnect with some of my my family members, one of whom is in this group today. Hi, Tad. So, uh, <laughs> but it was it was partly just uh, research tied to family business, and um, so I would take him back to school, and then I'd just take in a couple extra days, and you know, just go full blast at one of these places like Houghton Library. I just get the get it all set up ahead of time go in there and just do a marathon day and then oh, wow. fly back to Denver the next day. And I just, wow. I used like my personal camera just to take pictures of everything. Mm -hmm. So I didn't make a ton of copies. Mm. Um, I just get permission to use, use my camera um, and took all these pictures of all these documents. And then I just go home and take about another six months to a year to transcribe all of them. Oh, wow. So it was a long process and I didn't do a full time. I was, I had right. enough, I had a full time job at the time and I would just do this work for a few hours um, a week and usually in the morning. And then I went half time and then I had a little more time to do the work. And then I finally ended up the last year just quitting the job entirely so I could finish the book because it was, that's a full time job. And I did all the layout myself and, so it was time for me to really make up my mind that I was going to get this thing done. That's Great. really impressive. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. Thanks everyone. Thank you yeah. for coming. Yeah. Making time for us. Yes. Um, and just for everybody to know, uh, the session is recorded. So there will be a YouTube link that's sent probably early next week to everybody in case you want to revisit the conversation. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, Faith. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye.